When we say every week, service is our law, what do we mean? I think we mean not so much service is our law as we mean service is our prayer. In fact, that's the way that covenant is said in many of our churches, service is our prayer. And I think we say service is our prayer in a certain way to mean a certain thing, and I don't think we always explain what that is. When we say service is our prayer as Unitarian Universalists, one thing most of us are not saying when we say that is, well, this is the way we pray to God. We don't all believe in God or prayer. And so a lot of us think of that service as our prayers. When we do good deeds, well, that's how we pray. But I think that in itself can be a very superficial understanding of what it means for service to be prayer. As Unitarian Universalists, when we say service is our prayer, I think we mean more of what the Jewish tradition means by its term tikkun olam. Tikkun olam means repair of the world. And the meaning in the Jewish tradition for tikkun olam has changed over the years. It used to really refer to we repair the world, tikkun olam, by keeping the commandments, all 613, not just 10. We keep all the commandments, and by our behavior, we make ourselves the community of the world holy. And in the modern world, the idea of tikkun olam has changed from just keeping the commandments to being of service to the world in ways that go beyond oneself and just following the rules. It becomes a prayer to be engaged in the world. In the Jewish tradition, there is no real sense of personal salvation. People do not need to be redeemed or made okay with God. What there is a sense of in the Jewish tradition, and this is where tikkun olam comes in, is there's a sense that the community needs to be saved, repaired. That the world needs to be redeemed, repaired. And so, in contemporary Judaism, as it's practiced in many places, it becomes a religious act. It becomes a service as prayer to be involved in all forms of fighting injustice. For the world needs to be repaired and saved from evil, environmental desecration, oppressions of many kinds. And so this political involvement on behalf of repairing the world is something that has grown into a deep practice in many places, in many places of the Jewish tradition. Repairing the world is a prayer. It is a redeeming act, not of the individual, but of the world, a healing of not just the self, but the community and the world around us. I think this concept of service as prayer fits our Unitarian Universalist approach, where we believe no one's soul, no one's person needs saving or redeeming. Even with all our faults, we are already okay and holy. But in Unitarian Universalism, we have had this long-standing idea that we are more about deeds than creeds. It is more important about how we express and live out what we say we believe in than what we say we believe in. James Luther Adams talks about this when he says, there's no such thing as the immaculate conception of virtue. If good is to happen in the world, we must be involved in it. We have a moral obligation to create the beloved community. Not a holy self, but a beloved community. And the call to constantly repair the world, create a beloved community, has some difficulties that come along with it. One of which is compassion fatigue. And therefore guilt or shame that the world is in need of so much repair so much healing. 
I'm never doing enough. We are never doing enough. And so, when faced with this, I think one of the things that helps us is to see prayer not just as a personal, private endeavor, nor only as a community engaged in repairing the world, but as both. It's the concept that in the Christian tradition is called being an active contemplative. It is as old as the idea of Mary and Martha that John Mabry refers to in the reading this morning. And this is the short passage from the Gospel of Luke that, that John Mabry was referring to. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work myself? Tell her to help me. But Jesus answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need only of one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. And for a long time, this was traditionally meant to say that it was better to be in prayer and have your relationship with Jesus than it was to be about the work of the world. But in many areas of contemporary Christianity, it now means something else. It means you need both. You can't just be sitting in private contemplation, and you can't just be about the work of the world. You need to do both together. They feed off each other. When St. Thomas Aquinas was asked this in the Middle Ages, is it better to be privately devotional or be of service to the world? He said, yes. Both. You know, the way as Unitarian Universalists, we say, are you atheists or Christians? Yes. Right? Both. We are both and people anyway. And this idea of the active contemplative, one who has personal prayer practice or personal spiritual practice, and engages the world. This is not just a Christian idea. It is reflected in lots of other places. One of my favorite descriptions of active contemplative spirituality in the contemporary world is Starhawk's neo-pagan reclaiming community. And she says this, and this is, this is from her website explaining what reclaiming is. Reclaiming is a community of people working to unify spirit and politics. Our vision is rooted in the religion and magic of the goddess, the imminent life force. We see our work as teaching and making magic, the art of empowering ourselves and each other. In classes, workshops, ritual, we train our voices, bodies, energy, intuition, and minds. We use these skills to deepen our strength, both as individuals and as a community, to voice our concerns about the world in which we live and bring to birth a vision of a new culture. Tikkun Olam, repairing the world. Thich Nhat Hanh started a movement in the 60s called Engaged Buddhism. That Buddhism is not doing much good to the world if all it's teaching you is to sit in meditation yourself. That that centering, that deep grounding needs to be put into action in the world. He came out of Vietnam, his country ravaged by war. And he said that we must be engaged Buddhists. We cannot let this, go, this war and violence go on around us and sit in the meditation hall only. For if our meditation does not spur in us a need to pay attention also to the world and its suffering, what are we doing? In one of his books, he outlines 14 precepts for engaged Buddhism. Some of them are, do not be idolatrous. Do not be bound to any doctrine, the theory, theology, or ideology, even Buddhist ones. Do not think the knowledge you presently possess is changeless and absolute truth. Do not force others, especially children, by any means whatsoever to adopt your views, whether by authority, threat, money, propaganda, or even education. Do not avoid suffering. Do not close your eyes before your own suffering or before the world's suffering. 
Do not accumulate wealth while millions are hungry. Do not take as the aim of your life fame, profit, wealth, or pleasure. Live simply. Share your time, energy, and resources with those in need. Do not maintain anger or hatred. Do not lose yourself in your surroundings. Practice mindful breathing to come back to what is happening in the present moment. Do not utter words that create discord and cause the community to break apart. Make every effort to reconciliation and resolving conflict, however small it may be. Do not say untruthful things for the sake of personal interest or to impress others. Do not live with a vocation that is harmful to other people and the planet. Do not kill and do not let others kill. Respect the property of others, but prevent others from profiting from human suffering or profit from the suffering of the earth. Do not mistreat your body. Handle it with respect. Meditate. Eat well. Move. Whether it's a Christian tradition or a Judas one or a Buddhist one or a pagan one, personal prayer and spiritual practice does end up being service and prayer all by itself. You need both to make the complete religious life. For a complete spirituality, we need to be both Mary and Martha. We need not to be Buddhist, but engaged Buddhists. We need to repair the world as well as ourselves. <coughs> like many of you, I've been in somewhat disarray since early November. And one of the things that causes me disarray and anxiety in the last few months is I feel like I am never doing enough to stop the fall of what we hold sacred here into hatred, violence, tyranny. I'm never doing enough. And that feeds my anxiety, doesn't help it. So one of the things I've really concentrated on in the last few weeks is to develop and redevelop and pay more attention to my own personal spiritual practices. Before I could repair the world, I needed to really make sure I was repairing myself. True service as prayer needs a personal prayer practice or practices to support it. And true service as prayer needs a community to support both you and your service. So I turned more deeply into my meditation practice. Instead of just meditating every morning, frequently most days I'm also meditating at night. As the weather got just a little better, I forced myself every day to walk, which is a spiritual practice I, I put aside when the weather gets bad and I really need to keep it, to just be outside and get grounded into the world again. Not listening to music on my earphones, but just walking with the birds and the wind and the cool and the warm and the color. I've made sure I've taken time to sit and write. I've made sure I've taken time to play guitar and sing. I realized that those things were more important in the fight I'm engaged in than constantly listening to the news feeds all day. I've kind of limited myself now to New York Times in the morning and NPR over dinner, and that's it. And it's helped me focus my own service. So what is the service I can do with intention, regularity, depth, and dedication to something beyond myself? I had to find that service for myself again. And it was not easy because in my job, Service is part of my job, right? And I'm always the one encouraging you, do this, do this, get involved in the world, we've got this going on, right? And I realized that, you know, because I'm always doing this at work, I feel like I give it the office. And I think I've let myself off the hook of real engaged personal service to benefit me by benefiting the world. And so I looked for what I could do that was mine, 
not necessarily connected to church. Where it's wonderful that I have all those other opportunities to serve, but I needed some that would just mine again. And so I took the training to become a court-appointed special advocate for children in foster care. I figured I may not be able to repair the whole world, but maybe that piece will. And that's mine. I don't bring it here. Although I'm deeply grateful to the board for letting me go like, out of the office a whole week for the training. That was great. Thank you. Um, and I've gotten more involved in, in the town politics in Milford, making sure I pay a lot more attention. Even got my name on the ballot as town meeting member, of which somebody noted, I must be crazy. <laughs> but those are ways I can be involved for me, in my life, connected to but not necessarily a part of the church life. Because I needed to find that way to connect my personal practice to repairing the world in ways that I didn't do as a matter of course, that I had to pay more attention to and reflect on, because that's what makes the service prayerful. It's the reflection upon it. It's the reflection and the practice that makes the service prayerful. It is wonderful to go do many good deeds, but I think without reflection on them, they are just that, they are good deeds and not prayers. Out of liberation theology in South America, there came the idea that the most important thing in the Christian life was not your theology or doctrine, it was how you lived day to day in feeding the hungry healing the sick, opposing injustice and oppression. And people are able to reform their religious communities around what they call base communities, small groups or communities that would gather to reflect on their daily life experience as a way to put into practice their faith, their religious tradition. It mattered not so much what they said they believed as what they did and how their lives were affected. And it helped them take control over their lives. And it helped give rise to a lot of liberation movements and fights against injustice in South America. Um, when we gather on Sunday mornings, one of the things we are doing is we are being a base community. This, right now, is a time for us to reflect on all the service we already do as parents, nurses, teachers, caregivers, partners. Most of us spend most of our days in service already. And here is a chance to reflect on it. One of the ways we are offering now here to further reflect on our service and our living is the Chalice Circle groups. Pretty much an extension over the years from the base community model of liberation theology communities in South America to church groups in North America through small group ministry. It is a way we share as a community and reflect together so that our prayer has that reflection part and then our service becomes our prayer. Many of us spend a lot of time in service, whether it's at work or volunteering here through church or volunteering at church. Moving forward, let's continue to reflect together on our lives of service so that service is not our law, but our prayer. And perhaps as we do that, we will see if we are called to other service and other prayer, such as helping our newest neighbors with people like the Sentry.